Happy Father's Day. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of lights, in whom there is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. Father, we honor you this morning. We love you, and we trust you to help us to make it through uh, <laughs> these uh, unfortunate challenges that we're facing this morning. Father, we thank you that uh, your will and your purpose and your plan is your strength for each of us today, and we will have a beautiful service this morning. In Jesus' name I pray. And anyone who agreed said? Amen. All right, so uh, we're going to receive uh, your help this morning. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Welcome. Happy Father's Day to all of you dads and those of you that are here with us, those of you that are watching with us online. Welcome to our service this morning. A few glitches this morning, and but we're rolling. We're rolling with it in Jesus' name. Father, I thank you for this time together in the Word of God. I thank you for fathers. Again, we honor you first place. And then we honor our dads, we honor our fathers, we honor those that have led our homes and guided our families and taught us the Word of God and brought us to church and took care of the whole family. In Jesus' name, we thank you for good dads and good parents, and thank you in Jesus' name, amen. amen. We're going to receive communion this morning uh, after service, so... Uh, stay with us, and uh, if you're at home, thank you for joining us. We invite you to have a cracker or a cookie or whatever, a piece of bread, and uh, a sip of some sort of a non-alcoholic beverage, and then you can share communion with us as we partake together at the end of the service. Uh, again, every good and perfect gift comes down from God our Father. In James chapter 1, verse 17, from the Amplified Version, Every good thing given and every perfect gift is from above. It comes down from the Father of lights, the creator and sustainer of the heavens, in whom there is no variation, no rising or setting or shadow cast by his turning, for he is perfect and never changes. Thank God that God never changes, that when I'm not sure. Hey, Sam, you want to take over, please? Thank you. Um. Our God is perfect. He doesn't change. There's no shadow of turning with Him. And uh, I need a little help today. <laughs> Everything has gone haywire this morning. And so we want to recover. And we want to preach the gospel. And we want to speak the word. And. And we want to thank you. We're good to have you. Yeah, we're glad to have you, everybody. We want uh, God to be glorified. So we've been talking for this is my <laughs> this is my last week of talking from Hebrews, and so I got this incredibly long list of scriptures. So I'm not sure where I'm going to go right now. Yeah. All right, so in Hebrews chapter 6, verses 1 and 2 from the Amplified Bible, therefore let us get past the elementary stage. I need to get past this elementary stage right now, and I need to grow up into Christ in all things. I need to be a doer of the word. I need to seek first his kingdom. All these things are added unto me, and I can do all things. So I'm going to just go for it right now uh, and put everything behind me and we're moving forward. And you can jump up here and help anytime you want. Because, uh, <laughs> uh oh, uh oh, she took the invitation. Uh, I'm not leaving, though. You don't have to leave. But you know, this is a good example of what you do as a Christian when things go haywire and nothing seems to go right when you get out of bed in the morning, right? Oh, things are fine until we got here. Until I got here. <laughs> 
All is well, honey. All is well. I know. I'm just pulling it together here. You are. You're anointed and equipped. And <laughs> <laughs> hey, life happens, right? Life happens to everybody. Life happens to everybody. And God is good all the time. And we just move forward. We pull it together. We preach the word. Amen. Let's Instant, in season and out. All right. Let's, let's go for it. All right. Thank you. All right. So for our several weeks of being uh, in the subject from the book of Hebrews, in Hebrews chapter 6, verse 9, it says, Beloved, we're confident of better things concerning you, things that accompany your salvation, the things that we've been discussing and what we were going to tackle as we concluded our message here are things that uh, accompany our salvation. And uh, then we go on to perfection in this subject is we're going on to faith. In Hebrews chapter 11, 1, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And so everybody hopes for something. Hope is the goal setter, but faith is the power. Christians, hope is great. We want to be, uh, these things about faith, hope, and love. You got to have hope in order to fuel your faith. You need the Word of God to fuel your faith, but you've got to hope something. If you have no hope, you need to take a step back and you need to gather some hope, and this Bible is full of hope, and you need to find something. And, you know, some will just look in the back, and it's got hope under the H, and look for some hope, or find uh, something in Proverbs, or find something in Psalms, or find something in the uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Find something in the Bible that gives you hope, and keep searching until you find that hope, something that sparks hope in your life, whether it's finances, whether it's your family, whether it's your body, whether it's your mind, whether it's your life, whether it's your job, Whatever it is, find some hope from the Scripture. Latch on to that hope because without hope, faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. So in order for a person in this church and someone watching today for you to walk in faith, and my subject today is all about faith today because uh, we've been moving in Hebrews towards the, uh, the conclusion of faith. And so I, I have in Hebrews chapter 11, 1, Faith is the substance of things to hope for, the evidence of things not seen. So uh, why do we even pursue the idea of faith and confession and profession? I added those three things together because faith isn't faith without a profession out of your mouth. Faith isn't faith until it comes up out of your heart. You can say to anyone that you have faith. You can say it, but if it doesn't come up out of your, out of your mouth, it's not your real faith. You need to know what you believe and you need to memorize what you believe and you don't have to have a bunch of scriptures. You have to have a scripture of what you're standing on and believing for. So there's subjects throughout the Bible. You can even go to the back of the book. Uh, there are good Bibles back there that have subject by subject by subject and you can find what you need and then stand on a scripture and believe that scripture and begin to speak it out of your mouth. Again, we're talking about, I, I, I'm just making reference here to faith has confession and profession, which is valuable. And uh, because of the subject of faith, which we practice and we apply, it leads to something good. What does it lead to? If you have a scripture and you begin to say it, it's going to lead you to a place of meditation. What does meditation mean? It's not medication. It's meditation. It just means that it causes you to think about the verse that you're thinking about. A one, you only one need one. But praise the Lord, once you get one, you want some ammunition. Uh, you know, if you have a weapon, you got, uh, I think, I don't know how many rounds you have in there, but if you only have one bullet, then you want to make sure that thing is there. But man, it's great to have a whole load of them. And in this case, I want to have more than one scripture. Once I find what I want in the Bible, I want to back that up with other scriptures. I want to build that whole picture into my heart. And so what it does when you do have those scriptures, it begins to, to cause you to meditate because what you do is you step back back from that scripture and you begin to think about it. And so meditation is just thinking about it. God wants you to think about his verses because within each verse is power to bring itself to pass. So as I pursue faith and I start, begin to start saying it with profession and confession, that meditation of thinking about it in my mind, meditation isn't a weird word. It's not some, some uh, far eastern religious word. It just simply means I'm thinking about this continually. Or I'm thinking about it uh, often. And so it brings meditation. It brings memorization. 
We want to memorize a verse. See, if, if, you, if I called on somebody right now, what if I did? And, and you don't want to get embarrassed. I don't want to stand up and everybody shrink and go, I don't want to stand up and say a verse. But how many would be able to stand up and say a verse? Those of you at home, could you stand up in your seat and quote a scripture? This is where we go. This is our objective, is we're building these things into our life because Christianity is getting tested. Christianity is getting to a place where it's going, where uh, they're being challenged and tested, and, and maybe they'll even want to take away your Bible. I know that they don't like it on the internet. I, don't, I know they don't like it on TV. I know they don't like it in, in some countries. I know that there are places that are shutting down churches. They don't like pastors. They put them in jail. And so what, what are you going to do if they were to do that to you? Now, somebody goes, well, that's impossible. It couldn't happen in this country. This country's getting weird. This country has gone off the edge in some, some weird ways. And so they're, they're trying to be like the rest of the world. They're not, we don't want to be the United States of America. We want to be like everybody else. And let's move away from being the United States of America and be like everybody else. And so when they do that, one of the things they got to get rid of is they got to get Christians out of the way. Would they ever get Christians out of the way? Could they ever get Christians out of the way? I don't know. I don't know how much time there's left before Jesus comes back. But if there was, you know that they would attempt to do it. They'd attempt to take it out of the school, take it, uh, take it out of, of the public uh, sector in any way, shape, and form and get to a place where you don't have it. So, so when you know your scripture and you begin to memorize it, you have to memorize it by verbalizing it. And then once you know it, you memorize it, you verbalize it, you meditate on it, then it's activated and God's word becomes in your heart. It's in your heart and you're believing it and now it's a part of you and it's a part of your life and no one should be able to take it away. You said, well, hey, man, about five years ago, I memorized a couple of verses. Uh, well, what are they? Oh, uh, I don't really remember. Well, then you don't know them. You don't have them in your heart. You got to get the word of God in your heart. So we're talking about faith here. That's how faith is developed. You have the word of God in your heart. Faith is 244 245 times in the King James New Testament. 245 times. Why on earth is that word repeated? Uh, out of my Bible, let me just show you this for a second. This much of my Bible, that much of my Bible is the Old Testament, and only this little sliver right there is, is the New Testament. And in the New Testament is 244 times, 245 times is the word faith mentioned in just that little portion of this book. So uh, the question is, obviously, it's an incredibly important subject. Hebrews 11:6 6 says, but without faith, it's impossible to please God. That should be my uh, marching orders as a Christian. What is my, what, what, what is your, what do you want? Do you, want, do you want to go to heaven? I bet you everybody's answer, that is the simplest answer. What do you want? I want to go to heaven. Okay, well, if you want to go to heaven, then you need to know about Christianity, and you need to know who your Father is, and you need to know who the Son of God is, you need to know who the Holy Spirit is, and you need to know something about your Bible. And so I will never, ever, as a Christian pastor, I will never, ever, and if I do, fire me, uh, but I will never go away from the Scripture in the New Testament. I'll never go away from Scripture in Proverbs and Psalms and Genesis to Exodus, all the way through the Bible. I want to be a Bible preacher. Right now, it's not popular to be a Bible preacher. How do I know that? Because a lot of churches aren't preaching the Bible. If, if, if being a Bible preacher were a popular thing, everybody would be preaching the Bible. But I, I'm, getting re, I'm getting reports from all over the place that there are a lot of, a lot of pastors that are not preaching the Bible anymore. That's a scary con contemplation is that, you know, uh, are we in that time? Are we in that time right now where they're changing the Word of God? They're taking, they're taking really important parts of the Bible out? And that's a concern to me. But going forward here, without faith, it's impossible to please Him. So faith comes from the Word of God. And so by being in the Word of God, I have faith. Faith pleases God. Uh, faith is the, uh, uh, Bible faith is the only kind of faith that pleases God. Bible faith is the only kind. I said that twice in my notes. Uh, faith which is developed from the Bible is the kind of faith that pleases God. Uh, uh, let, me, let me just give you an example. Where's Kiara? Okay, wherever you went, Kira, I was looking for you. I was going to use you in an example this morning, but I'll use Randy. Uh, no, actually, I'm not going to use Randy on purpose. I don't want to. I'm going to use Gowan. 
No, I can't use Gowan because she. <laughs> Gowan, Gowan was with us yesterday, and I know what Gowan says. So I need I need a stranger, but I'm just gonna use Randy as if I didn't know her. All right, Randy, here's a dollar for your opinion. Okay, as far as take that dollar, and you can keep it too, by the way. So. So your opinion, even though you're really smart. And I know you, you know the Word of God, but if you didn't know the Word of God, your opinion, to me, personally, would be worth a dollar, okay? But because Pastor Nancy, I got, I got a gift for Father's Day from my daughter, and there was a 50 in there. And so, because I know Pastor Nancy knows the Word of God, her opinion to me is worth 50 times what just a general opinion is. And so if I, I'm just going to hold this 50 up, which they're fun to have, uh, you know, whenever you get one. But I know that Pastor Nancy's opinion is always going to be the word. And I know Randy too would, but we're pretending like Randy doesn't know anything. And so her opinion, <laughs> not that Kiera wouldn't, but I was going to use her. But, but Randy, if she doesn't know anything about the word of God, then she's going to give me her opinion. She's going to try and opine on what we're talking about, and I can just go, I'll listen to you politely, but you don't know what you're talking about because you don't know anything from the Bible. But now, if I go and I present the same thing to Pastor Nancy, I know she knows the Word of God. I know she knows what's in the Word of God, and I know that she's going to give me a very strong opinion that I may not like, and she's famous for giving opinions that people don't like. Why? Because she tells you the truth. And in the day we live in, truth is not welcome, it's not received, it's not, I mean, here it is, of course it is. But there are many, many, many that would rather hear an opinion than to hear the truth. And in my estimation, her truth is 50 times more valuable than her opinion. If you have an opinion... It's worth a dollar to me. But if you have the word of God, it's worth 50, 500, 5,000, 500,000, 5 million. It's worth way more valuable than opinions. Why? Because the word has power in it to help me to, to be better in my life. Your opinion, you might be really smart. You might have the answer to the equation. You might have the answer to something that's going on. You might point me in a, in a nice, positive, friendly, hopeful direction. But opinions, everybody has one. So they're worth $1. But the word of God is worth multiple, multiple times more. And I want to amplify that today, that as we talk about faith, faith comes from the word of God. You don't have faith just because you say, I believe in Jesus. You have faith to be saved, but you don't have faith in the word of God. You have to build that word into your life. You have to open your Bible. You have to read the Bible. And as a matter of fact, you have to go back to the subjects and find your subject. What's your subject today? Your subject may not be faith today, but my subject is faith today. I'm talking about faith. I want all of us that all, and, and this is not any criticism or insult or anything. But I want all of us to be able to stand up when we're alone. To be strong when we're alone. Where we don't, hey, wait a minute, I'll just call, I'll call my friend and she'll tell me what the right scripture is or where it's found. No, I want all of us to be able to know when you talk to your parents, when you talk to your family, when you talk to your sister, talk to your brother, when you talk to your children, when you talk to somebody at work, that you have answers. It's unacceptable. And I'm saying it with a smile. To me, all of us. It's unacceptable for us to not know where the answers are. Simple answers. I should have an answer. I should have a scripture to solve some issues in life. And right now it's Father's Day. Um, I don't know how many people are going to visit their dads. I don't know how many of you care about your dads. I don't know if, how many of you know your dad. But we should know and then the songs were built to talk about some of those things where I know what to say in a gentle, loving way. If my dad's passed away for a long time, but my dad, listen, let me tell you something about my dad. My dad was a, 
one of the greatest role models I ever met. My dad, listen to this. I want somebody to hear this clearly. My dad was mentally ill. My dad took powerful drugs to eliminate. He was in a concentration camp in World War II. And he escaped and got out just before they were putting people into the gas chambers. My dad had these war scars that drove him nutty. And so when he finally got into a place where he could slow down and think, it started to drive him nuts. He went nuts. But my dad was a born-again Christian. And my dad would get up every morning, turn on KTIS radio, make a pot of coffee, and sit down at the kitchen table and read his Bible with KTIS music in the background or preaching or whatever. He'd read his Bible and sip his coffee, and I'd see him do it every single day. What did my dad give me? I believe that I come as close to getting in the Word every single day of my life as anybody I know. That means I think I'm better than anybody else or perfect. No, I'm just saying that I learned something that had incredible value, incredible value, because I saw the kind of effect it had on my dad. Did it? He didn't know about healing. He didn't know about the power of deliverance. He didn't know that, that, the, that by the laying on of hands and by the prayer of the saints and by the prayer of agreement and by all these things that you come out in the name of Jesus, you foul spirit of mental illness. There were times later on in life when, when dad would go off his medication and he'd go nuts and he'd be laying there freaking out. I don't want to scare anybody, but this is my life. And I wish I knew now what, I wish I knew then what I know now. I was a young Christian. I wasn't even sure if I wanted to serve God. I was running around like a, like a, a hoodlum and all that stuff. But then when I got to the charismatic church, the charismatic church, don't criticize the charismatic church. You know why? Because they believe in laying hands on people. And I believe in the power of laying hands on people. And what I wish I could have known was to go to my dad and lay hands on him and just bind the devil off of him and pray for peace and joy in, my, in his mind and the fruit of the Spirit, uh, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance for my dad. Instead, those times, they'd come and get him and lock him up. Now, this is supposed to be a fun day. This is supposed to be a happy day. This is Father's Day. But guess what? When I weigh these two things, the memories of my dad freaking out when not taking his medication versus my dad waking up every single day doing the same thing, which was to get in the Word. Guess what I learned? I learned that every day I need to be in the Word. Amen. I learned that my strength is not very... It, my strength doesn't last very long if I don't stay in the Word. When I say that, I don't mean I just go off the rails or off the deep end. I'm just saying that I need my time with God. And so, you know, I, I don't know how I even got on that, but, but this is a great message because there are many of, of, of uh, the people watching or anybody, some that we know that maybe... There are times when you think you're nuts. I think we all thought, have thought that at some point in our life where we're just going, wow, the pressure's on in my job or the pressure's on in my family or the pressure's on in my marriage or these kids are driving me nuts. How many, how many moms have you ever heard that from? These kids, ah! <laughs> my mom used to run away. She'd always go to the neighbor's house. But she says, I'm running away. I can't take you guys anymore. And there's six of us, right? And she'd run down to the neighbor's house, she'd chill out, and then she'd come back home and, oh, Mom, we're sorry. We, we don't listen to you and we don't do what you tell us. And, but guess what? You weigh these things, and when you weigh them, I used to have to go to church on Sunday night. Nobody in school went to church on Sunday night. And we did. And now I sit here and I think about it and I go, there are a lot of things that our parents made us do, but you know what? When I weigh it, I've been trained well. 
my pastors believed the Word of God. The pastor's wife was our Sunday school teacher. They taught us the Word of God. The pastor preached the Word of God. He got a lot of people mad at him because he told the truth about what was in the Bible. What's all that mean? It means that without faith, it's impossible to please God. And faith comes by hearing the Word. So, frankly, I could serve sandwiches and beverages to everybody in here and give them a little, a little lunch, you know. Uh, you know, you'd have your choice of what you'd like, and, you know, and you'd have a little something. But that's not going to last you till the next Sunday or Wednesday or whenever you go to church. That's not enough. And this right here, I, I would like, you know, uh, today we had the most scriptures that I've had in a couple years, but So, back to opinions. With that dollar, Randy represents anybody in the world and their opinion. And with that 50, that represents anybody that knows the Bible. And let me throw some names out at you. Neil deGrasse Tyson, he's a handsome black man, genius. I think it's Macheo Kaku, he's a Asian-American genius. Travis Taylor's a red-headed genius. Tierra Ginn, or Jin is a young 21-year-old African-American genius. And I really like them. Whenever I hear them, they're fascinating because the ones that I listed, they're some of the brightest humans on earth, and yet they have the ability to simple, sim simply communicate. And, and yet, without God, their opinions are valueless. They're the smartest people on earth. And I would rather have Pastor Nancy's opinion because she knows the Word of God, then all of these geniuses, even if it's an area of, of uh, uh, microbiology or some just, you know, astrophysics or whatever field they're in, I'd still rather have her opinion. And frankly, Pastor Nancy will give you an opinion anytime. She, any, I mean, she is about the, she's the last person on earth that shies away from giving her opinion. That's a good thing, my dear. You're a, you're, a, you're, a, you're a blessing. You're a powerful woman of God. There's no doubt. And so the $50 bill, give me my 50 back, by the way. <laughs> this was my Father's Day gift. You can keep that one, Randy. You, 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 got, you got the small one. <laughs> uh, I thought the Bible says, given it shall be given. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over. Some men give unto you, but yeah, you shouldn't be taking back gifts, right? But it was, an, it was used for an example. All right, so going forward here, value of man's opinion will never amount to much compared to the value of God's opinion. My brothers and sisters, until God's opinion means more to you than anyone else's opinion, you have not crossed over into faith. I mean, faith, you've got simple faith, of course. You're saved, of course. If you believe that Jesus died on the cross, was raised again from the dead, and he's your Lord and Savior, of course, that's faith that causes you to be saved. But when we get to this place of, I need, I need faith in my job, I need faith in my family, I need faith in my marriage, I need faith in every area, I need faith for finances, I need faith for healing, I need faith for my brain, I need faith for all these things, human opinions can't help. So what is my basis for concluding that only Bible faith will please God? That's another point that's critically important. How many of you, and those of you watching, 
want to please God, realistically. Nobody has to even keep a straight face because we don't want to read you. How many real, it really matters that you please God? Because faith pleases God. In, uh, in Isaiah 55, 11, one of the greatest verses on, in, in all of Scripture, it's probably in my top five. And it says, So shall my word be that goes forth out of my mouth. It shall not return to me void. It shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing in which I sent it. So shall my word be that goes forth out of my mouth and will not return to me void. It shall uh, accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereto I sent it. So it will not return to him void. Returning the word of God to him is to return it verbally to God some way, somehow. And so when I, when I take that scripture to be one of my top ten of all my verses that I, I love, I see in this verse that uh, so shall God's word that goes forth out of his mouth. When it returns to him, it needs to have something in it. And God wants us to return his word to him in faith. And so what I'm doing is I'm taking words that are found in the Bible and I'm saying them back to God so that there's uh, strength in there, there's faith in there, there's hope in there, and there's uh, all these things going back to God. And so I've got a, a two-way street going here. I don't just go to God. I just don't dump on God and say, I I got this problem, this problem, this problem, fix them, I'm out. I'm communicating, I'm fellowshipping, I'm, I'm, I'm studying, I'm doing these things for my, my faith to grow and to, uh, uh, that I'd have a heart full of faith. So I'm going to machine gun through some scriptures, and uh, these are all familiar to you, and I'm just going to read them, and somebody's going to hear something that just goes boom. I love that verse. And so just make a note of it. But in Romans 10, 17, the Bible says, faith comes by hearing and hearing God's word. So we just covered the idea that Bible faith pleases God. So Bible knowledge pleases God. You know, hey, many, you know, we, we say this, I, I say it all the time. This is what it's about. We could get into subjects like yesterday in our class Revelation class, we got into a subject that was way outside the box. And I'm not even going to give you a hint because you need to come to Revelation class to find out the <laughs> stuff we talk about. But we had a group there, and I got a report this morning from someone that said they loved what we talked about yesterday. And I was concerned that it was going to make them afraid. I thought what I talked about yesterday would bring fear. And that's why I kind of shrunk back maybe from presenting it because it's outside the box. And yet, that's the first report I got and it was that they loved what we talked about yesterday. Because what we do is we take challenging things that we, we don't really have an answer to, but we wrap them around the word. And so even if there's, a, there's an empty spot of something that we don't understand, if we wrap everything around the Word, then we stay strong on the Word and we can face challenges that we don't have answers to and we don't understand. Right now, everyone is facing something that they don't have an answer to or they don't understand it fully, but yet when you wrap yourself around the Word of God, you have peace in your heart. You, you know that God is with you. You know that God has the, all the knowledge you need. He is absolutely perfectly and perfect in wisdom and knowledge and understand God is perfect. And so I'm, I'm at rest. You're at rest. We're at rest in peace because God knows even if I don't. And so I encourage somebody right now with that truth. All right, going forward in Hebrews 11.1, 1, it says that faith is the substance of things hoped for. You, do you hope for anything from God, or are you going to do it all yourself? Do you hope for something from God? Do you at home hope for something from God, or are you trying to do it all yourself? Does anyone over here hope for something that they have to have God's help, otherwise it won't happen? There are a lot of things that we're faced with that will not happen unless we have God's help. You got to have some hope. Everyone say hope. hope. Hope is the goal setter. Faith is the power. I remember that great message long ago. I think it was Brother Caps. He said it. He looked at the thermostat on the wall. 
That thermostat on the wall does not put any heat out. You, can't, you could put your face, face up against that thermostat, and there would not be one cooling air drop there or one bit of heat coming out of there. But that is the goal setter. That thing sends the goal to the power, wherever the power is, and then it sends air through these vents, and we get heat and we get cooling. So the Bible word is the goal setter. The power is God's word is backed. He backs his word. with. He confirms his word with signs following. God confirms his word with signs following. So um, one, one another thing that, that is, is important is that you don't let go of, of a scripture just because you, you got hope in a scripture and you let it go. Don't ever let go. Hold fast to your profession of faith without wavering. Why? Because he's faithful that promised. He made the promise. You have gotten a picture of it. And now that you have a picture of it, that's your hope. Now you need to continue to believe that scripture and build that scripture into you until faith comes because the Bible says, hold fast to your profession of faith without wavering because he's faithful that promised. That wasn't on my list of 100 scriptures, so we'll continue on with my list and see how far we get here. All right, by faith in Hebrews 11, we'll talk a couple of places from Hebrews 11. By faith, Enoch was translated that he should not see death. And he was not found because God grabbed him. God translated him. God took him. That's pretty fascinating to me. He disappeared. Hey, here's a question that we, we try and tackle when we're in Revelation class. Did he cross over into a dimension or did he get translated right to heaven? How does that work? I don't know. But I'll tell you what, God took him so he was in the presence of the Lord instantaneously. Some people, you know, good Christian uh, theologians and stuff say it's just stepping over into a different place. But for me personally, because it talks about heaven, I believe you go to heaven and I like that. So you can, you can decide what you think, but the Bible says that Enoch is in heaven. Hebrews chapter uh, 11, verse 7, By faith Noah was warned of God of things not seen yet. He was moved with fear and prepared an ark to save him, so the saving of his house, by which he condemned the world and became heir of righteousness, which is by faith. God has prepared an ark for you and I. There's an ark called the rapture. I teach that. I believe that. That the Lord shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet of God. Do, 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 do. The dead in Christ shall rise first, and we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together. They're not going to precede us. They're going to go with us and meet God in the air. So if Noah had an ark that he took the animals and his family into, and they were protected from the flood, some people say, well, you think your rapture theology is your escapism and it's your ark well praise god it is i like it i don't want to be in the tribulation i don't want to watch this world tumble and continue when all the horrors of the book of revelation unfold the bible says in chapter 4 verse 1 of book of revelation and i john said i saw a door in heaven open and the next thing that happens is there were people, uh, multitudes that you couldn't count around the throne. In the first three chapters of the book of Revelation, John talks to the churches from Jesus Christ. He records what the Lord Jesus Christ tells him to record as far as what he says to the churches. And the one church that he didn't rebuke was the church at Philadelphia. And he said, if you keep my word, I will keep you from the hour that is coming on the earth. Amen. Guess what verse I know? I got an idea of what he said to all the other churches. He rebuked them. But he said to the church of Philadelphia, 
because you keep my word, I will keep you from the hour that's coming on the earth. Amen. What hour's coming on the earth? Well, the whole book, last book of the Bible tells you about the tribulation. Seven years. It's clear. It's clear for those that study. It's not clear for those that don't read their Bible. It's not clear for those that, that listen to other people tell them instead of finding out for themselves. I'm not picking on anybody. I'm encouraging everybody to find out for yourself. What do you believe? Are you going to try and find a piece of property up north and, and, and hide up north when seven years is going on? There's good woods up there. There's good lakes up there. There's, you, know, you can get some fish. You can get some wildlife. You, can, you, know, you might be even plant some fr uh, fruit and vegetables or whatever. But are you going to be able to hide from the Antichrist for seven years? To me, that's not believable. What is believable is that the Lord will take us with him. You know, I just heard this in my heart just now. In the parable of the virgins, there were ten virgins and five were wise and five were unwise. Five had oil in their lamps. Five ran out of oil and when they went to get extra oil, the bridegroom came. They had waited, they had all ten had waited for the Lord. They were all waiting for the Lord or they were waiting for the the marriage and the wise had plenty of oil and the unwise did not so what, what do you think oil is I don't know I, I, I think staying in the word gives you oil knowing scripture gives you oil having faith gives you oil so, so what, what are you telling us today is that you know hey the same thing I tell you every Sunday every Wednesday you need the word of God. So shall my word be that goes forth out of my mouth. It shall not return to me void. It shall accomplish that which I please and it shall prosper in the thing whereto I sent it. The word is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, able to pierce to the dividing asunder of the soul and spirit and joint and marrow and discern the thoughts and intents of the heart. Hey, go on. What for? Simply because I want to have the word of God in my heart. The only way I can get the Word of God in my heart is to have the Word of God open on a regular basis. In Mark eleven twenty two through 24, Jesus answered and said to them, Have faith in God. For verily I say unto you that whosoever shall say to this mountain, Be removed and be cast into the sea and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that the things that he says will come to pass, he'll have what he says. Therefore I say unto you, what things so you desire when you pray, believe that you receive them, and you shall have them. Matthew 17, 20, and Jesus said unto them, they asked, they came to the Lord and said, why couldn't we do a miracle that we saw you do many times? And Jesus' answer was, because of your unbelief. For verily I say unto you, if you had faith as a grain of mustard seed, you would say to this mountain, remove hence to yonder place, and it would remove, and nothing shall be impossible unto you. Matthew 21, 21. Jesus answered and said unto them, verily I say unto you, if you have faith and doubt not, you shall not only do this which is done to the fig tree, but also you shall say to the mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea, and it will be done. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Faith is believing what God said. How many mountains have I cast moved out of the way? Well, thank you for that. Pastor Nancy said we have moved a lot of mountains out of the way. I was going to say no, no virtual physical mountains have moved, but difficult situations faced with trouble, faced with things that we had no answers to many, many, many times over the years of our marriage and, and the things in our histories that have proven out. That God is on our side. Thank you for that encouragement. Amen. We have. We have. We have. Mark 9, 23. Jesus said, if you can believe, all things are possible to that person that believes. Luke 8, 50 says, Jesus heard, he said, answered, saying, fear not, believe only, and she shall be made whole. On the opposite end, 
Matthew 8, 26, he said unto them, why are you so fearful? Oh, you have little faith. Then he arose and he rebuked the wind and the sea, <laughs> and there was a great calm. I don't know how many of you go out on the water, but I'm out on the water all the time. I've talked to the water many times. It didn't stop roaring. It's going to one of these days. I'm going, oh, yeah. I like to go fishing in my boat. But he said, why are you so fearful? So Jesus tells us fear negates your faith. Wow. It'd be nice to be able to stand here and say to you guys, I don't have any fear. I'm a fearless guy. And there's some areas where, you know, maybe I'd qualify. But generally, there are things that intimidate me. There are things that trouble me. There are some things that even upset me. So when Jesus said, why are you so fearful? I know that I must continue to develop my faith. And you and I know faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word. So in order for me to, I have to plug into the power because if I stand there with my cord in my hand, I'm not tapping into the power. I need to tap in. I need to plug in. I need to get faith. Faith comes by hearing the word of God. All right, let's keep going here. I've got about 30 more scriptures, but we won't even try that. I just put, I, I had a, a summary of all this that I was going to roll through, but in Luke chapter 8, verse 25, he said unto them, where is your faith? So, if Jesus were standing here today and he said, Pastor Nancy, stand up. And he asked you, where is your faith? I know you and I know what your answer would be. Your faith would fire right back at Jesus. My faith is in you. My faith is in your word. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7, the scripture says we walk by faith and not by sight. Right now, you may see something in your life that is frightening. Maybe it's, I won't, I won't even try and identify it. I won't sow that. But when we walk by faith, not by sight, if I'm looking at the negativity, if I'm looking at what's wrong, if I'm paying attention to what hurts, and I, and I realize, hey, if you're hurting right now, it's hard to ignore pain. But the solution, according to Scripture, is to not walk. We, we walk by faith, not by sight. So our lesson on a continuing basis is to keep our focus on the answer, keep our focus on the power of God, keep our focus on the Word of God, and trust Him in whatever circumstance you may be in right now. I want to encourage everyone that we start with Ephesians chapter 3.17, that Christ may dwell in your heart by faith. Christ is not in my head. And Christ is in my body because he, he, he heals me, but Christ lives in my heart, in my spirit. When I accepted Jesus, when you accepted Jesus, Christ came into our heart, into our spirit. And so by the Holy Spirit, he is living on the inside of me. And so I choose now to walk by faith and try not to walk by sight. And there are things that, you know, it's hard to, to, uh, to keep your eyes from looking at when maybe, maybe it's a, a bill. Maybe it's a, an issue or a problem in your life that just keeps popping up and, and, and you've been standing in faith and you've gotten people to agree with you in prayer. But we keep our eyes on Jesus Christ. We keep our eyes on the prize. 
Hebrews 10, 38 says, Now the just shall live by faith. And if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. Going on here, I want to I jump to this last point from Hebrews. We've talked for, for seven weeks from Hebrews, but I skipped this one over and over. But I want you to hear it today. In Hebrews chapter 5, verse 12 through 14, Sam, do we have that on the screen? Hebrews 5, 12 through 14. For though by this time you ought to be teachers. Who? Who? Who should be a teacher? But you need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God. And you've come to need milk and not solid food. That is a rebuke that some of us have backed away from some things in the Word. And I believe Apostle Paul wrote this book. He said, For everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the Word of righteousness, for he's a babe or a baby. For by this time you ought to be a teacher. You need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God and you have come to need milk and not solid food. For everyone who only has milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness. He's a baby. Verse 14, But solid food belongs to those who are of full age, that is, those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern between good and evil. If you're listening to the world, they don't know how to discern between good and evil. If you follow their opinion, you'll be so mixed up, you'll never get it straightened out. That's why we need to listen to the Word. We need to stay in the Word and stay in the church and stay where someone's preaching the gospel. Solid food. Solid food belongs to those that are of full age who by reason of use they have their, even their senses. My senses know when something's wrong. Hey, there are some of you that are so sensitive spiritually that you know without having to hear it or, or, or know anything about it that you are, uh, uh, you have your senses discerned to know what is right and wrong. Last two verses, and then we'll receive communion. 1 John 5, 4. This is whatever, but, you know, it makes more sense whoever. For whoever is born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. And so what we've been talking about for about eight weeks now is faith and we understand what Hebrews just said that each of us should be at a place of growth and development and if we're not growing and we fall back into this category where we're back to milk instead of solid food then we're in that baby stage and, and I, 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 I believe that most everyone in this room and watching are mature enough and grown enough with uh, strong meat from God's word to live a higher level of Christianity. And I just want to, as we begin to prepare for communion, higher level of Christianity, the, one of the first things is deny the world. Deny the flesh. Deny fear. The world, the flesh, and fear if I'm not fighting against the world in my life, if I'm not fighting against the flesh in my life, if I'm not fighting against fear in my life, then I've moved back into that babyhood stage where someone's just going to have to take me by the hand and help me. So if you're in a place right now and, and maybe those things are dominating your life, God wants you just to take that step up. Before we take communion, you know, I'm asking everyone to 
commit to taking a step up because it's dangerous, my friends, to receive communion if you're not willing to take a step up. You can't keep going back to the communion table and not judge yourself. You can't keep going back to the communion table and not changing. God wants you to change. Now, I'm looking at some really good Christians, so please don't anybody get into condemnation and go, oh, woe is me, I'm the worst of the worst. No, you're not. You wouldn't come to this church if you were. You'd find somewhere, you'd find somewhere where they just help you and comfort you and, you know, say what you want to hear. But because you come here, you're strong believers. You're useful in the kingdom. You've got faith. God wants you now to use your faith to help someone. Someone in your family. Someone at your job. Some youth that might be you're available to. Somewhere, somehow, you're useful to somebody. And it won't be challenging because they'll just come over and ask you. I remember, uh, let me just tell you a couple more stories. There were people, they knew I was a Christian. I minded my own business, but somehow they knew I was a Christian. So they'd seek me out in private, and they'd either ask me questions or tell me, pro- tell me their problems or whatever, but they knew that I would have Bible answers. Well, it was probably because I carried a little pocket Bible, and every now and then they'd see me looking through this pocket Bible. So they knew I was a Christian. So they figured I had some faith, and they knew I could probably pray and ask God to help them. You can be used that way. All of you can be used that way. God wants to use you. You don't have to get up in front of a, uh, an audience. You don't have to be out there where you're uh, out on the streets all the time winning people to Christ. That's great stuff for many people that do it. But somewhere at your job or somewhere in your family or somewhere in life, somebody's going to pull you aside and say, I know you're a Christian. I know you believe the Word of God. I know you probably know the answer to this question. And then you'll have it. And you'll pray with them. And they'll believe. And God will help them. Can someone say amen to that? Amen. Amen. All right, why don't we say the salvation prayer together before we can receive communion. The Bible says we need to judge ourselves. And so the most important thing to judge yourself of is, am I a believer? And don't let the enemy talk you out of it. If you accepted Christ as your Savior and you kind of know in your heart that you are, nobody's perfect. So we're saying, yes, I am a believer, and therefore I judge myself, and I'm going to receive communion this morning as fellowship with the Lord through the body and the blood, the cup and the wafer, and I'm going to receive communion today. So let's say the salvation prayer. Dear God in heaven, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. I believe that he died on the cross for me and was raised again from the dead so that I could have eternal life. Jesus, come into my heart. Be my Savior and be my Lord. I ask you to forgive me of my sin. I receive your forgiveness now. I receive eternal life. I thank and praise you for it. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. All right, Pastor Nancy, do you have anything you want to share before we receive communion? All right, so what we're going to do is uh, the ushers are going to pass the communion up. Please hold your cup and your wafer, and we'll all receive communion together. I'll read a few verses from the 11th chapter of 1 Corinthians. chapter 11 of 1 Corinthians 23, for I have received from the Lord, the Apostle Paul said, that which also I delivered to you, that the Lord on the same night in which he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and I'm going to skip the part that we're going to read in a moment, but let's go down to 26, he says, as often as, you got ours, okay, thank you. Verse 26 is for often as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he comes. But whoever eats the bread 
and drinks the cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. So let a man examine himself, let a woman examine themselves, and then let them eat the bread and drink the cup. For anyone that eats and drinks unworthily eats and drinks damnation to themselves, not discerning the Lord's body. So when I take this wafer, I am trusting and believing that this wafer is the Lord's body, a representation of the Lord's body. For anyone that eats and drinks unworthily eats and drinks damnation to themselves, not discerning the Lord's body. And for this cause, many are weak and sick, and some even die. So it's not this hor horrific warning, but it's just to let people know that this is, this is absolutely serious business, the cup and the wafer. He says, but if we, if we would judge ourselves, we'd not be judged. But when we're judged, we're chastened of the Lord that we should not be condemned with the world. Wherefore, my brother, brethren, when you come together, wait for one another. So don't anybody take their communion without waiting for everyone else. Do you have any words you want to share, Pastor Nance? Again, the Lord, the same night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he took and he broke it, and he said, take and eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Lord, we just honor you. We honor your body that hung on that tree and the punishment you endured. We accept that as part of our faith. In Jesus' name. In the same manner, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the New Testament in my blood. As often as you drink it, do it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he comes. Again, whoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup in the Lord, an unworthy man shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. Father, we thank you that we honor you with this bread and this cup. And therefore, as we judge ourselves, we judge ourselves as being in faith and receiving today in a worthy manner. Thank you for the bread and the cup. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Well, we had a little bumpy ride, but praise God. If you would have never said anything about a bumpy ride, I don't think anybody would have noticed. Well, good. Thank you. That's all right. God is good all the time. Amen. I love that. <laughs> Because it's true. God's always faithful to his word. Just stay the course. We don't give up. Don't grow weary in well-doing. What does that mean? Don't stop doing what you know to do. Keep moving forward. If we faint not, we're going to reap. We will reap the promises. So praise God. Well, we're going to receive uh, the offering this morning. And I was in uh, Proverbs again this morning. <laughs> In chapter 10, verses 3, 4, and uh, 22, the Lord will not allow the uncompromisingly righteous people that are living for him. That's what that means. You've just made a determination that you're going to live for God. The Lord will not allow us to famish, but he thwarts the desire of the wicked. Verse 4, here's a little bit of wisdom for you. He becomes poor who works with a slack and idle hand, but the hand of the diligent makes rich. When we're faithful in our jobs, when we're faithful in life to do what we know to do, we're going to reap blessings from that faithfulness. Verse 22, the blessing of the Lord, it makes truly rich, and he adds no sorrow with it, neither does toiling increase it. We can have God, 
helping us in every area of our life or we can toil at life ourselves. I personally made a decision a long time ago. I'm going to do it God's way. I'm going to do it God's way. And that includes giving. It includes putting God first in every area of our life. And that includes putting God first in your finances. And when you do that, you're giving God something to work with. He'll open doors for you that no man can shut. I've seen it in my own life. I've seen it in the lives of people that have been a part of our ministry over the years. People that put God first, that are faithful in giving. Man, they've increased. God's helped them. God's blessed them. And it's been good. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to be in your kingdom and to participate in kingdom finances. You help us. You help your people. You open doors for each of us that no man can shut. You put us in the right place at the right time. Your favor surrounds us like a shield. Father, I pray that each one of us would seek you diligently every day, that we would put you first in every single way. And we just honor you. We thank you for the gifts, the tithes, and the offerings this morning. We lift them up to you, Father. We present them to you from a willful, cheerful heart. We thank you for helping us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, um, we stocked up the food pantry, and this is kind of cool. I just was praying the other day and had it on my heart to be able to provide some some healthier options, things like wild-caught tuna versus normal tuna that's been, whatever, modified. Kind of big into eating things that are not modified if possible, right? Because they're healthier. It's just proven it's healthier. And so I reached out to a friend of mine, not a part of the church, and just asked if they'd be willing to help sponsor our food pantry a little bit. Because there's a lot of people in the church that... Um, that take advantage of, of that. And uh, got a good report. So I went shopping. Kira helped me last night. So there's some organic stuff and some healthier options for those of you that um, would like that. And uh, just pray that you'll take advantage of it. And, of course, there's no, don't feel bad if you need some assistance. That's what it's there for. That's what being a part of the church is all about. So if there's things that, that you could use to help augment your your food and different things, then please feel free. Same with the Bibles and the books. We just decided a long time ago, you know, a lot of churches have bookstores, or they used to. I don't know if they do anymore, but we just want people to have the Word of God and have the help that they need in different areas. And so we'll, people will bring books in that they've purchased and and put them in the bookstore, but you're free to take stuff. If you read it and you're done with it, you can bring it back, but there's Bibles back there, and we just want you to have as much of the Word of God that you want and can read and consume and use and put to practice so that you can walk in the goodness of God and His fullness in every area of your life. So please help yourself, and then um, Church Picnic is coming up. It's always a super fun time. It's the second Saturday in July, which this year is July 8th. So Saturday, July 8th, we're going to meet at Theater Worth Park. Um, we'll provide rides for anybody that needs a ride. We leave from the church to do that. So we'll have a sign-up starting next week. We're going to cater in the food, so uh, it should be a lot of fun. And it's just a good, just a good way to hang out with the family of God outside of church. So we hope that it fits your schedule and you'll be able to make it and we'll have uh, maps and details and stuff for you. So, excuse me. So Father, just thank you so much for this awesome Father's Day. We celebrate our dads again, stepdads and aunts, uh, not aunts, uncles, sorry. <laughs> we celebrate uncles and grandpas and, and men of God who provide mentorship and not only for their own families, but 
perhaps for other children. And God, we just thank you so much for the strong men. We pray for our men to be strong in the Lord and the power of your might. Thank you, Father, for the rest of this day. We pray over our church. God, that no weapon formed against us in any way will prosper. Every tongue that would rise up against us in judgment, it's condemned and shown to be in the wrong. That's our heritage as children of the Lord. We thank you for blessing us in Jesus' name. Amen. Have a wonderful afternoon. We look forward to seeing you on Wednesday night.